That's right, we're still dancing to dubstep. Yes, how was your coffee break? Do we have a beer? Oh, yeah, you definitely had a beer. You should share it with your friends around you. Welcome back, everyone, for the final session of today. <laughs> Keep clapping, because you came back. Thank you. And we have an incredible big hitter for this afternoon. I'm not even going to stall anymore. Let's get right to it. The Future Mundane by the one and only designer, futurist, former head of design at Google. X, that's right. The one and only. Nick Foster! <laughs> Feel free to dance the dubstep, Nick, if you want. <laughs> hello, 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 hello. Is everybody warm enough? <laughs> Everyone? It's my first time in Amsterdam. Is it always like this? Yeah. Good, good. Thought so. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thanks for staying. Uh, my name's Nick Foster, um, and I want to talk today about the ways in which we think about the future. Um, particularly want to share my own evolving position on how I look at the future, having done this for a little while. So put up my bona fides. Um, I've been fortunate enough to work for some pretty interesting companies in my life. Over the last 25 years, I began my career at Dyson in the 90s um, before moving to Sony. Then I spent some time with Nokia. Uh, and then I moved to California and started working for Google. And over the last 25 years, I've been helping those companies uh, think about the future, think about how they might tackle the future, think about emerging technologies, think about the products that they might create. And for the last eight years, I've been head of design at Google X. So for those of you that don't know, oh, nice, we got a fan. For those of you that don't know, uh, X, as it's actually called, is a place where Alphabet makes some of its biggest bets about the futures. So it looks at new technologies and tries to convert those bets into realities. And you might know us for things like this, Waymo. So the self-driving car originated in X and was the first graduate of X in 2016. Also, Loon. This was one of the first projects I worked on, which was where we were trying to take balloons and fly them over underserved, under-networked places to give people connection to the internet. Also, we attempted to tackle what I think is the hardest part of the robots project. So robots working in unstructured human spaces, working alongside humans, trying to figure out and collaborate with humans. But this is the everyday robots project. So I've done that bit. It's like an on-ramp. Do you trust me yet? I think I'm a futures person. I'm a person that spent my career thinking about what's over the horizon, what might be coming next. Um, working with new technologies, helping companies trying to figure out where to point and what might be out there. And I was introduced just a moment ago as a futurist. And in truth, I've only started using that term quite recently because I struggle with it. I don't wear it well. It doesn't feel right on me. I do it because it sort of describes what I do, but I don't like it. Mostly because of what I think it says about me. And I think it has something to do with this, the word futuristic. And when I say futuristic, I think we have a collective cultural and industrial and societal problem. I think we're really stuck. I think we're caught in a little loop. And this, world, this word represents a world that you know, I don't want to be associated with. And what I want you all to try and do, you don't have to, but if you want to, just close your eyes and think of the word futuristic. What comes to mind? Things like this, right? Exotic things, things in weird shapes, weird colors overtly futuristic things, things that are challenging, you know? Or sometimes people talk about things like this, humanoid robotics, magical devices, sort of cybernetic versions of ourselves with these superpowers. Occasionally, you'll get people talking about the future of cities, perhaps, with these gleaming great spires of transparent architecture with hovering drones delivering people to work and light-speed monorails taking them around the world. Often, this is very of the moment, you know, people will talk about the future of work, and they'll show these folks sort of wafting at these blue flickering wireframes of something. You know, I'm being a bit cheeky, obviously, and I'm trying to pick these images, but it's not just me. I know it's not just me, because if you search Google Images for future or futuristic or the future, it looks like this. Towering cities, sweeping white architecture, bipedal robots, all lit weirdly in purple and blue. The future is going to be purple and blue. <laughs> and I'm just really curious, like, how do those images get there? Who puts them there? Why are they so homogenous? It's really depressing and annoying to me how repetitive this is. 
how we have amazing, difficult, complex conversations about everything from soccer to cut flowers. But when we think about the future, it all looks the same. So over these 25 years of doing this work, I've come to a, I don't know, what do you call it, a recognition, recognition, an idea. But I think our collective imagination about the future has become hopelessly and unhelpfully colonized by science fiction. And it results in an environment I don't want to be a part of. It's an environment like this, an environment of escapism. The purpose of images like this, and videos like this, and visions like this, is to be rolled out at trade shows, to be created for the preparation of people so that they buy things or click things. They're thirst traps, to use contemporary lingo. They're designed just to get more clicks, more people excited, please like our brand. And the reason I say please like our brand is images and videos like this typically come from marketing budgets. They don't come from new product development budgets. They don't come from engineering teams. It's also a very, very repetitive, as I've mentioned, something in that, very repetitive environment. These same ideas get rejigged year after year after year after year. Minority Report was, what, 20 years ago? And we still see these concepts of gestural interfaces and transparent displays. And I think there's this unhealthy relationship between science fiction cinema and industries of the future. And they just kind of keep going round in a circle. And all these ideas just get concretized. And they become this sort of immovable object that we just have to kind of make it, because we've talked about it so long. And worse still, I think it's a fantasy land. Images like this, to me, they're pornography. All they're designed to do is to make you go, Fwah! you're like, Fwah! sexy, right? There's nothing I can do with an image like this. It doesn't acknowledge the present at all. It's not designed to have any kind of rational debate. It's just designed to make you feel a thing, right? And I'll be honest, I spent the early part of my career making things like this, because that's what I thought I had to do as a futures designer. And it was fun, and it was exciting, and it was engaging, and I learned some good CAD. But I've become disillusioned to this way of thinking over the years, because I just couldn't get away from this. This is the house where I was born. So I spent the first 18 years of my life in that top left window. And I don't live there anymore, but somebody does. And houses like this might be quite familiar to most of you, I would guess. What does the future look like for them? How do we get from there to those images I just showed you? Is there even a route? Why can't we build futures that acknowledge this, that understand that this is our lived existence? So I've been spending my career asking that question and trying to think about that gap. Now, obviously, particularly because I live and work in Silicon Valley, when you start to criticize science fiction, there's a huge sort of collective intake of breath. People get a bit nervous. And it's got such a dominant place in our society when we talk about the future. It's sort of heretical to say science fiction can be anything other than a wonderful way to think about the future. And obviously, I work with some very talented people who are very, very good at reading good, hard, highbrow science fiction and making those interpolations and thinking about what it really means. But the truth is, to get from books like this to meaningful product requires a massive amount of interpretation a massive amount of pragmatism. It's a huge journey from audacity to pragmatism. And honestly, I just don't think that work is being done. Science fiction is not a pitch. It's not a product strategy. It's not a balanced proposition. It can help us think about societal implications of things or wallow around in like what might be. But it's not a real way to start thinking about the future. So I'll try and get a bit more creative now. Uh, over the last sort of 10, 15 years, I've been trying to address this sort of schism that I've got in myself, try to think about ways that we can think about the future in meaningful, rational, well-balanced, achievable ways, because that's actually my job, not to make fantasy, to make things real. And so I've developed a framework. Framework's a bit strong, but, you know, three things to remember. I call it the future mundane, and there are three things just to keep in mind when you're consuming science fiction, sorry, when you're consuming <laughs> future visions, or creating future visions. So we'll get on. First one, the future mundane is filled with background talent. And now background talent is a term from, I think, the movie industry, but you might know them as like non-playable characters, extras, the chorus line, whatever. You know, people in the background, essentially saying, just like in the present, in the future, that the population will be 
background talent, ordinary folks in the crowd. So let's dig into this. When we talk about the future, because it doesn't exist yet, we have to tell stories. And when we tell stories, we tend to fall back on normalized tropes of storytelling, one of which is the hero. So every generation has had its heroes, from the Greeks to the Romans to the Vikings to contemporary cinema. And heroes are really good. They give us something to hold on to through a story. They give us somebody to grapple with, and they give us a story that we can follow. They all feature heroes, and they do, do the same things, basically. This is the hero's journey, which is the hero exists, they have some hardship, they overcome some very difficult thing, some epic event happens to them, and they solve something, and then they learn, and we go back to the beginning. The hero's journey. And so when we see science fiction cinema, it looks like this. We have a hero, hero at the center. The hero is living a very unusual life. And therefore, when we watch science fiction cinema, and we read science fiction literature, it's really tempting to sort of grapple onto that and say, that's what we need to design for, that story. But we forget that that person is not living the lives that we'll be living. It deeply affects the types of futures that we create. And we create stuff like this. These sort of fictional alpha people leading really strange lives, doing incredible things with weird products. These sort of unrealistic hyperhumans with superpowers. But you know, the truth is, you know, Tony Stark is not your user. He doesn't really even exist. And even if he did, he'd be a market of one, because his life is not our lives. By definition, he has to be going through something extraordinary. It's much better when you're watching science fiction cinema to think about the old lady that lives here, and where she buys milk, and whether her garden still floods, and is she still arguing with a neighbor about the leaf blower. These are the kinds of things that will happen in the future, as they do in the present. Because in spite of everything we've been taught by reality TV, or by motivational coaches, people on stages like me, or contemporary advertising even, we are not special. We are ordinary people. We are extras. We're people in the crowd. We fill in the scene. That's what we all are here. And so are all of our customers. The future will be a world of routines, of ordinary, everyday existence, regular experiences. You know, when we talk about a bell curve distribution of population, the reason it's shaped like a bell is because everybody's in the middle. So what can you do? These are the kind of things I like to produce. Whenever we were starting a project at X or in some of my other freelancing work, trying to think about the ordinary, everyday moments that might come before, during, or after the big whiz-bang piece of technology we might be talking about. So somebody might be interacting with an amazing new immersive surgery equipment, but they will have had breakfast. They will have somehow commuted. They will have done ordinary, everyday things. And just trying to think a little bit about that context and spending some time building that production design to help people think, ah, actually, what would it really be like to live in that world? And also thinking about new technologies like nutraceutical food, foods, for example. It's very easy to get into like magical pill and you suddenly fit. But I really like to think about how things might become trash how it'll just be value engineered down and down and down and down and normalized over many, many eons to just become part of everyday life, just white noise. They start to feel really real then, and it stops you having this abstract, fantastical, superhero type of conversation and start to really think, what would this new technology be like in a two-for-one deal? So that's the first pillar. The future mundane is filled with background talent. Second pillar, getting closer to beer time. Uh, the future mundane is accretive. And now, accretive is just a fancy academic word, a way of saying stuff just piles up over time. So let's look at that. When we look at visions of the future from corporations or from individuals or from science fiction cinema, they often look like this. And all of you, as good citizens of the future, should ask, where did all the old stuff go? Was there a big government mandate that you had to pull all that stuff out of your kitchen drawer and empty the closet and go in the loft and just burn it all? so that we could just produce this new, singular future. And we'll all live in it, and we'll just forget that there was ever anything else, ever. You know, the Germans are good at making up words, and they've got a good word for this, Gesamtkunstwerk, which I hope I'm pronouncing correctly. But it means a total work of art. The idea that we can understand and control the bounds of everything we're creating, everything we're proposing. And when we think about the future, we tend to fall into this trap we tend to feel like we're in charge of the whole extent of everything that we're working with. We see renderings like this. 
skyscrapers, right? Big things, and then they just gray out all of the neighborhood, like it won't play a fundamental role in how that building exists and how it works and how people might move through different spaces. We just ignore the rest of everything. And the truth is, the present looks something like this, right? There's two good reasons why that. Humans are very sentimental, covetous, we hold on to things, we inherit things. But more importantly, everything evolves at different speeds. Technologies mature and die at different speeds. So we might be designing a modern 20th, 21st century uh, piece of technology, but it might live in like a 19th century cupboard on an 18th century rug in a 17th century house. That's just the way the world is. It piles up all around you all the time. And I mentioned it before, but over time, technology just becomes stuff. It normalizes, it slots into our lives. Why don't we tell stories about technology that is mature and it's become part of our culture and become part of the way we live, rather than this big thing everyone sort of stood around basking in its modernity and its glow. And you know, the, the present is like that, so the future is almost certainly going to be like that. And yet again, when we look at images and videos from the future, I'm not being particularly mean to this particular idea, but we see stuff like this all the time, right? These sort of renderings in these non-contextual gray spaces, like a Cornell box or some rendering environment. And you look at it, and all you can do really as a designer or a creative person or an analyst is sort of go, yeah, nice shape. It's got no context at all. There's no license plate. There's no permits, there's no roads, there's no people, there's no weather, there's nothing to let me say whether this is a good or a bad idea. So you just kind of go, nice. Same with software. I think there's a lot of software people here today. When we look at like visions of the future of software, we know that software is an accretive thing in our lives. Everything is built on history and history of other pieces of software and services. Interaction norms, infrastructures, logins, payment norms, any of that stuff. Yet when we're pitched images about the future of interaction or the future of service design, they look like this. And just to really drill this one home, think about a really simple product. I did an animation. Um, simple product, Amazon Echo Dot. Oh, thank you. Uh, Amazon Echo Dot, $34.99, cheap product. You kind of, it's, it's very, very simple in its interaction. It's a little puck, you yell at it, it yells something back. In that interaction, it's so fleeting, we just sort of forget about it. But there's a really wonderful project by Kate Crawford from 2018, which is the anatomy of an AI system, where she tried to actually unpick what happens during that fleeting moment of interaction. Just huge interconnected chains of dependency, algorithmic processing across different networks and optimization technologies and software norms and user data management and all the stuff. Actually, in that interaction, I don't think there's a single human that can hold all of it in their own head. So again, what can we do? Well, I like to create these pieces of fiction around projects, something as very, very simple and ordinary and mundane as a receipt for a date, let's say. You know, when you, when you see a piece of thing like this, it's very easy to just ignore it. But imagine it was a piece of evidence in a murder trial or something, and you start to really pick over it in forensic detail. What you realize is you can tell a ton of different stories concurrently. You can tell stories about things that have remained the same, things that have changed, things that have radically changed, and they can all pile up, and all these little micro stories all happen at once. And when I'm presenting images of the future, I insist on putting some stuff from the present alongside it. Because that's, look at the world. That's how it is. So let's start doing that some more. That's the second pillar. The future mundane is accretive. Final pillar, the future mundane is a bit broken. So there's no technical language in this one. The future mundane is a bit broken. So I'm a designer. There's probably some other designers here, some innovators, investors, future type people. We tend to want to make the world better, for any given definition of better, right? But I think we get carried away. We just start working towards this notion of a utopia. We want to create these beautiful, seamless, perfect, well-working things. Some version of like up and to the right. Whatever thing we're me measuring, we want it to get up there somewhere. But we get carried away and we start to build these things and we start to start talk about them as if they're this utopian solution. And Morrissey, who's a problematic person but a good lyricist, said, every day I play a sad game called In the Future When All's Well. And it just feels like that, right? Utopia, by definition, cannot exist. We get trapped in this world of trying to de develop these beautiful, seamless, amazing experiences. And yet we turn left, and this is, this is going on, you know? The world is absolutely full of broken things and things that continue to break. 
It's absolutely inherent in the grain of modern life. It is there all the time. And if our aim is to make better stories about the future, we should include it. Another good quote, Paul Virilio, the French cultural theorist, the, the invention of the ship was also the invention of the shipwreck. There were no shipwrecks before the ship. I found it really useful throughout my career to think about these second and third order implications of what we might be making. When we create USB-C, we create the dongle. We live in a world of patches and workarounds and short-term fixes and you know, additional things. When we invent panoramic stitching, what an amazing piece of technology. We also invent the half dog, <laughs> which is when a dog runs so fast through the algorithm, the algorithm loses its mind. And now this is a problem somebody has to solve. It's somebody's job now. They have to fix that. It's not a problem we ever struggled with before. You know, connected doorbells, they can help us with amazingly small micro problems in our lives, and they're very useful, but they live precipitously on the edge of connectivity networks. And we need to look at that, see that, make a note of it, and include it in the way we think about the future. But it's very hard, and I say that as a person that's worked for a long time in these kinds of industries. And we have a problem. I think the industries that shape our future have become trapped. And they've developed this overriding culture of what I call toxic positivity. There's a joke within a few companies I've worked in, which is any company over 500 people, everybody works in advertising. Which is we spend so long trying to convince and sell and get buy-in to our ideas through all different departments or different teams or investors or whatever it is, that we just don't want to talk about how it might go a little bit wrong, how it might be bad, or the thing we might be putting out in the world might accidentally start something we're not quite sure how to fix yet. It takes immense bravery to do that with your idea. And honestly, honestly, it's not happening enough. So I used to like putting the images like this at the end of decks, which is we've got this great idea about this new thing that we might be doing, but it might go a bit wrong in these ways. And at least you've got something to talk about then. You've got something to point at and you'd say, we don't know how to fix it, but we know it's a problem. Or actually, maybe we do know how to fix it. Like, how might people circumvent the things we're putting out in the world? How might they try and break them? How might they try and like, create new weird economies around them? This is what it takes to rigorously do and think about the future. So that's the end of my talk. The Future Mundane is filled with background talent. Everyone is ordinary and normal and in the crowd. The Future Mundane is accretive. Stuff just piles up over time. Let's look, make the future look and feel like that, because it will. And the Future Mundane is a bit broken. Things won't work perfectly. There will be second and third order implications to everything we create. And we can't possibly see what they all are, but we can create some of them, talk about them, and try and solve them. So that's my talk. If you disagree, feel free to argue with me on Twitter. Thank you. Thank you. There was nothing mundane about that talk. Nick Foster, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Stay with me for 30 seconds. Sit down at the back there. I didn't say you could leave. I'm just kidding. 30 seconds of your beautiful time. Hey, thank you so much for staying with us on the vision stage all day from 10 a.m. to 5 today. Give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you so much. A few things. So there's a KPM karaoke cruise kicking off uh, in an, you know, just over an hour or so. I'll be there. I'll see you there. Um, we also have the return schedule for uh, different ways to get back. <laughs> Scan the QR code. You'll be able to figure out a way to get home. Uh, of course, there are some future events that you should definitely be part of. Go check them out. Uh, FT Live. Future AI, 15th, 16th of November. That's actually my birthday. I'll see you there too. TNW Valencia, April next year, 11th and, uh, 11th and 12th. And of course, TNW Conference next year. That's right, take a photo. Finally, I'll see you all tomorrow. We'll be back in this beautiful room from 10 a.m. And we have the most amazing lineup for you. We'll kick the morning off with crafting a responsible and revolutionary future, very reimagining the future. Thank you from me, Matt C. Smith. Thanks to Nick, the tech team, everyone who's put this together. I'll see you later. Ciao. <laughs>